<laughs> there's only one way to do a proper review and that's to actually machine something to build it to put it together to test it to run it and then you know something's good you know that's what's coming up mm, i don't feel like reading hey should we go to the workshop hey So this is the centerpiece of my workshop. It is a Chinese lathe. It, I got it from Ardendorf Machinery Mart and it has been such a cool tool to use. But how good are these Chinese lathes? And I've seen quite a few reviews on YouTube where the guys come and what they do is they put a dial gauge on the chuck and they say, oh, there's movement of the chuck. Look at that. Oh, it's 20 micron out. Or what they do is they put a bar in the chuck and they measure it. No, it's a little bit out. But fundamentally, that is flawed. A review like that just means very little. And the reason is a chuck has got certain tolerances when they build it. It's, it's backed onto a backing plate. Then there's bearings in the spindle head. And also a round bar is not 100% round. So measuring a 20 micron out in the chuck is just a useless exercise. And then what, this, what, what some guys do is they take the taper inside the spindle, they put a DTR on the inside of the taper and they go, oh, it's 20 micron out or that's 10 micron out. But the thing is, that might be within spec. And again, if you handle the chuck and you move it around, you are going to get some movement on your DTR. And it's fundamentally just because this is an assembly. I have a very accurate old German milling machine and it's a horizontal milling machine and that has journal bearings on the inside. It hasn't got your standard um, taper roller bearings. And even that, when you pull up the journal bearings, you pull it up to a 20 micron accuracy when you when you apply a force on the spindle. So to get a 10, 20 micron accuracy on a lay spindle with taper roller bearings is actually pretty good. So all these YouTubers that go and they measure stuff on the lathe and they all oh, look at the U, U, DTR moving and all of that and all oh, this moves. Rubbish. Ultimately, this is a tool and it's designed to get a product out or a design out or a spindle out or whatever. So this review of this lathe is not actually going to be measuring stuff in the lathe because let's be honest, who cares? What I am going to do is I'm going to show you just how accurate and how cool this lathe is by showing you something that I made using this lathe. And I tell you what, if you think that, that what I do is like one of a kind, no, anyone can do this. All you need to do is you need to know your machine and you know you need to know how to work with it. So I'm going to give you a motivational review of this lathe by showing you something that I built. I hope you guys enjoy it. So there's nothing much better than a finished working prototype to prove how good a machine is. And fundamentally, there are four things that you're looking for in a good quality machine. You want flexibility, you want accuracy, you want repeatability, and you want reliability. So my American 440 that I finished a couple of years ago, tick all of those boxes. And I'm going to use examples of this working prototype to show you just how good these Chinese lathes are. Now, before we get there, my American Loco was scratch built. That means that every piece I added some value into it to get it to a finished component. I made my own patterns, I cast my own components, and I machined everything myself. And at the end of the day, I have a really, really cool American Loco that runs around a five gauge track that I built myself. But Let's just have a look at this example and see how it fits into proving that a Chinese lathe is actually a really good machine for the home workshop. 
And we're going to have a look at each of those four components separately and see how they apply to this specific loco and how good these machines are in the, or for the home workshop. So when you do a loco like this, the lathe needs to be incredibly flexible. And I'm not talking about flex in the bed. I'm talking about the lathe needs to do a mirage of different operations. If you have a look at the, the wheel, for example, the wheel is quite large. So you need to have a certain amount of swing. Incidentally, the largest wheel that I've done on this lathe is a wheel for a large sterling, seven and a quarter inch sterling single, and that was over 30 centimeters. And this lathe, lathe has just enough swing to do that. So to give you an idea, that is quite large. This is sort of what it looks like on the lathe. It's a picture I took while I was doing it. And this is it sort of being clocked up when I do the cranks. But yeah, let's get back to the American loco. So, the wheels have a shrink fit tire that go onto the outside. And again, there's a whole lot of machining operations to do that. So you need to clamp on the inside and on the outside, depending on what you're machining. So this lathe is incredibly flexible. But on the other side of the scale, if you go towards the cylinders, now holding these cylinders is a completely different ball game. You need to start having a look at your four jaw chuck or a backing plate or a face plate or something like that then the accuracy of the internal bore and the piston becomes a big issue. But we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later when we talk about accuracy. What I do want to show you is these tiny little taper slides. And incidentally, I'm using the standard measurement for showing scale, which is matchstick. These standard, uh, uh, these little drain cocks at the bottom of the cylinders are teeny tiny little components. Those are M2 screws. And there's a tiny little taper valve on the inside there. Now, if we think back at all these reviews that the guys do and they complain about 10, 20 micron accuracy, if that little taper valve leaks, it will leak at, say, 20 micron very, very quickly. These valves don't leak because otherwise you would just see steam coming out of the bottom of the cylinders when you saw the, the loco driving. So that means that the machining accuracy of my lathe is well within 10, 20 microns. In fact, it's probably better than that to get a taper to seal on this size. So I would say that's probably a better review than taking a clock and dialing it up. And that brings us to the second point, which is accuracy of the lathe. How accurate can these lathes actually get? So to show accuracy in this build for my lathe, probably the best thing to use as a good example is the steam injectors. Now, an injector is an incredibly difficult thing to make. The tolerances are very, very tight. And I can honestly say that I have never had to scrap an injector. Every injector that I've made has worked perfectly. For those of you guys that don't know what injectors are, basically there's four cones. It works in Bernoulli's principles. So it takes energy away from the steam, steam pressure of the boiler. It adds that energy, that pressure energy to velocity energy in the, in the water and they combine the two. And then it increases the pressure to above boiler pressure and it feeds it back into the boiler. Now, a little thing that I do on my injectors, which a lot of guys frown on, is my overflow is always flooded. So I always have water coming out of my injectors. And I do that because of a corrosion issue in my boilers. All of my boilers are designed using a very specific material and I do not want oxygen getting into my boilers. So I always have overflowing in my injectors and I design them that way. But from an accuracy point of view, the injectors are probably one of the more difficult things to make. The components are tiny. They all fit in a little tube that's less than five millimeters in diameter. And these four little cones that fit inside the tube are obviously smaller than the tube. They have different um, angles and, and stuff like that. And then the smallest hole is typically about a 0.3 or 0.4 millimeter. Now that is very doable in my lathe and I've made a couple of these injectors and I've never had an issue. But a nicer way to show accuracy on a lathe is the piston and cylinder fit. This is another thing that a lot of guys get very, very wrong. 
the fit is as follows. Now I can give you the tolerances for the piston and all sorts of nonsense like that, but at the end of the day, it's it actually doesn't matter. What you're looking for is a steam tight fit, but a mechanically loose fit. Now that sounds counterintuitive, but all that that says is you don't want steam bypassing the piston, but you do you don't want mechanical resistance between the piston and the cylinder. And one of and one of the easiest ways to test this. If you put your cylinder on an uneven surface and you drop your piston down your cylinder, it should just drop down to the bottom because all the air at the, at the underside of the piston will just escape. But if you put that same cylinder on a piece of glass or a granite uh, top, then that piston should go down very, very, very slowly. And that shows you that you have a good fit. And that right there is probably the best test for saying, hey, this lathe is pretty accurate. Repeatability is actually one of the easiest things to show. Because if the left hand side and the right hand side of the train aren't the same, the mechanism, then the train just won't go. But a very nice way to show repeatability on the lathe is all the small little fittings. So all the copper components, the, the sort of steam lines and the water lines, I make all my own ferrules and end uh, sort of coupling nuts. The reason why I do that is because I want a very specific look for my models. And typically you need to make quite a few of these things at once. So it's a batch operation and you typically make like 50 or 100 while you add it. And every one of these need to be the same. Otherwise they don't fit up properly on the lines. So when all these copper lines go together and it fits and there's no steam leaks, then you know that you've got very, very good repeatability. So finally, we come to reliability. One of the things that a lot of people say, Chinese lathes are not reliable, blah, blah, blah. Well, look, I have done five locos all together, and let's assume that each loco takes 5,000 hours to build. It doesn't, of course, it takes a lot longer than that, but let's be conservative, 5,000 hours. I've done a little three and a half gauge William, and I have done a Sterling single, which is my design, which is quite a large loco, which pushed the limits of my lathe in terms of size and bulk. Then we've done the wire, which I've just shown in, in this video. I've also done a small little Ballarat, which is a timber loco from Australia. That also took a very good uh, 5,000 hours, a fun little loco to build. And then I've just finished the Fire Queen, which was a ridiculously scaled loco to build and was recently published in Model Engineer. That was a shockingly difficult loco to build. It really did push the limits of what I could do with the machinery that I have. So let's conservatively say 5,000 hours for each loco. That's not including all the bikes that I've built and all the little other odd jobs and stuff like that. You're looking at a minimum of 25,000 hours on a machine. And it has given me nothing but good service. So I think reliability is properly ticked. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. It's a slightly different way of doing a review on something. And I hope you liked the format. Thanks for watching. Really appreciate it. If you want any specifics on any of the stuff that I do in the videos, please leave a comment and I promise I will try and do a video if you want something specific.